Uh, I got a couple of minutes here. What I wanted to do is talk to you about our company, uh, what we do, kind of some of our challenges that we had, um, and then you know, just kind of open up for questions if you want to ask any questions of me, kind of uh, about the entrepreneurial journey. Um, so I'll get it out there. I'm a pretty young dude, uh, probably about the same age as most of you guys. Uh, so don't don't feel like it's uh, intimidating or anything to ask any questions. Um, so uh, the company that I started was a company called Fiscal Note. Um, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not have heard of it. Uh, our mission really is to kind of reinvent the way in which legal information is analyzed and structured uh, throughout the world. Um, a little bit about ourselves, we were founded in 2013. Um, uh, we we're backed by a couple of investors that I'll talk about a little bit later. So, so far we've raised about $40 million in venture capital. Uh, we have over 200 enterprise clients, uh, you know, up and down Fortune 500. Uh, about 150 employees will be about 200 employees at the end of this year. Um, recently, uh, we were named uh, a technology pioneer by the World Economic Forum, uh, where we get to present at Davos and, and uh, speak a lot about the initiatives that we're seeing across artificial intelligence. Um, some partnerships aligned with Thomson Reuters and Phone to Action and a couple other companies. And uh, by my count, we are now the largest legal tech startup um, by headcount, by capital raised, by customer count. Uh, in the United States. Um, here's our timeline. So uh, very quick, it's been a last, uh, very interesting last couple of years and three years. Um, you kind of see through it here, 13, we we're about, uh, 2013, we we're about 15 employees. Uh, we tripled that in 2014. We grew uh, uh, by about 30 people. Um, by 2015, we we're sitting at about 70 employees and servicing over 100 enterprise customers. Um, today, you know, we're kind of hitting this trajectory where you know, now servicing hundreds of enterprise customers. Um, and now I think you know, going into the end of 2016 and into 2017, we're seeing a lot of uh, opportunities internationally. Uh, we just completed our first acquisition uh, of a company out in Korea, uh, you know, built a JV out in China, uh, partnered with some companies out in Europe to kind of continue to expand our reach internationally. Um, a couple of our customers here, you can kind of see um, across the board, uh, healthcare is by far our largest vertical. We service everybody from Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Davida, Anthem, AstraZeneca. Uh, some of our other clients include companies like um, Microsoft, uh, Uber, Salesforce, um, up and down the line, Southwest Airlines, Staples, Walgreens, uh, who are all using our platform every single day to understand legal information, legal analytics. Um, so what I want to do is spend a little bit of time talking about our story, how we built our company from the ground up, um, and kind of the some of the lessons we learned over time. Um, the first thing is, you know, all of you here in, in Washington, Washington is sort of like, you know, ground zero for government affairs and legal uh, services. Um, Washington, D.C. has the highest concentration of lawyers uh, in any city in the United States, about six lawyers for every thousand people, which is, uh, in my opinion, an egregious amount of lawyers, but um, <laughs> um, that, that's a separate topic. Um, and what's essentially happened over the last couple of years is that um, the space has become incredibly complex. Um, you know, you have uh, a uh, a complex and fragmented legal system. Um, as Congress has become a lot more deadlocked, you have 50 state legislatures, 9,000 city councils, um, all passing different pieces of legislation, a patchwork of legislation around the country. This trend is not changing. Some of you may have noticed uh, in the European Union, uh, the United Kingdom just voted themselves out of the European Union. It looks like a lot of other countries are going to be joining them. So it looks like there's a lot more fragmentation with respect to uh, how laws and regulations are percolating throughout different enterprises. And so think about it from this perspective, right? If you're a, co a company like Uber, right? Or if you're a company like Microsoft or Amazon, um, you're dealing with a variety of different regulations and legislation from pretty much every major state, every major city, every major country around the world, right? Everything from sales taxes to labor laws to the way you deal with environmental compliance. All of these laws are constantly changing every single time. So how do you actually understand what to comply with, right? It's a, it's a massively complex problem and the way in which people have done it previously, it's really fun. You, pay, you essentially pay lawyers a ton of money. I mean, I'm talking hundreds of millions of dollars per year to interpret the laws for you. Or you pay you know, companies like Bloomberg or Thomson Reuters or LexisNexis um, similar amounts of money, so tens of millions of dollars to interpret this, con to interpret this content for you. So um, what we found was that current software for lawyers is really bad. I mean, it's just incredibly bad, right? You have, great consumer companies coming up um, you know, in this day and age, trying to build great consumer experiences. Um, but now you have uh, enterprise software, particularly in our space, that was incredibly bad. I've, I've never met a lawyer that actually enjoyed using any of the software that was built for them in the last couple of years. Um, 
And so what we found was that the traditional ways of managing government affairs, managing legal services in a typical enterprise is incredibly broken. Um, and so we also saw on the technology side of things a couple of different trends happening, right? So number one was a lot of the data was moving to the cloud. Um, you know, a lot of the ways in which companies were adopting software was fundamentally changing. Um, you know, previously companies would be, you know, the way you companies bought software is through uh, this massive, massive enterprise sale plus some licenses on top. Now companies are much more comfortable paying month to month or quarter to quarter. Um, you have massive advancements, advancements in natural language processing and artificial intelligence, new web frameworks um, that allow you to essentially uh, build web applications very, very rapidly in the, in the scope of maybe a week or two um, you know, for rapid prototyping. If on-demand computing and things like AWS that allows for massive amounts of computing power in a very short amount of time in a very cheap way. Um, and so the fundamental ways in which people were thinking about customer experience is changing, right? Three particular technologies that we looked at very early on was in natural language processing. So some of you may know things like Watson. Uh, you know, Apple just released their new iPhone today with some uh, sweet upgrades in, in Siri. Um, you know, there are some new you know, advances in, in machine translation, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Some of these new technologies are enabling things like self-driving cars uh, in, in identifying cancer much earlier through computer vision, um, in Internet of Things, and, and you know, there are major, major advancements in things like um, you know, using drones to understand uh, you know, agricultural trends or using uh, you know, uh, connected devices and uh, you know, things like smartwatches to understand uh, you know, a concept of somebody's health on a constant basis. So there's this explosion of data combined with the ability to make sense of all that data using artificial intelligence, and then new ways of interpreting data and interacting with data from a natural language processing perspective. Um, so fundamentally, the raw materials for computing were completely changing from the ground up, right? The infrastructure, the applications, everything was completely changing, right? And so your expectations as a user on the other end of the computer are fundamentally changing as well. Um, the other thing that we found was that great business excellence is no longer tied to just sales and marketing excellence, right? The IBMs and the SAPs of the world and Microsofts of the world, um, a lot of their experience is coming from you know, creating great channel partnerships, great sales experience, which is still important, but the major crux of business innovation in the 21st century is having an incredible product experience for customers. So what we invented was essentially something called the GRM, right? So the Government Relationship Management Platform. So what we do is we aggregate uh, information, right? So we ingest information, uh, we structure it, uh, we analyze it, um, and what we do is we provide insights for our users on a variety of different things. So on, on legislative data sets, we can predict the outcomes of a piece of legislation with over 94% accuracy when it comes to regulatory actions, so things from the FDA or the SEC or FAA or whatever the case is, we can actually predict how likely a regulator is to enforce a specific action. Um, and here's a really cool thing. Um, for court cases, we can actually predict with high levels of accuracy the probability of you winning a court case with over 85% accuracy using artificial intelligence. So as you can probably imagine, not only are we completely changing the game in terms of the way in which people understand and access legal information, but we're providing an entirely new layer on top of that in terms of analytics and insights. Um, what we do is we essentially automate a lot of the different functions uh, within a, 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 an enterprise legal function or compliance function. Um, we provide a lot of optimization. And so there's a, a, a ton of efficiency that can be gained from actually getting all of your team members on a specific uh, uh, you know, platform. Um, and then we provide a lot of analytics and insights, right? So very, very powerful analytics around legislation, around regulations. Uh, we can essentially drill down on any major issue. You can give me any major issue around the environment, ride sharing, securities, healthcare, pharmaceuticals. And we understand the regulatory uh, changes that are going on. Um, the platform today monitors roughly about 1.5 million pieces of legislation, about 700,000 regulations across the country about almost 20,000 legislators and staffers, um, 7 million comments that have made on regulations, and we update roughly about 125,000 individual entities where we alert people on different changes in legislation regulations across the, across the firm. Um, our data infrastructure is actually what makes all this possible, right? So we spend a ton of time building this data infrastructure and essentially being able to build this uh, platform that collects data, cleans it up, validates it, and analyzes the data. So, to get back to our story with that context in mind around the market, uh, these are my two co-founders. Uh, you know, I'm in the middle, Gerald's on my right, and then Jonathan's on my left. 
Uh, we actually knew each other since elementary school. Uh, so I've known Gerald since sixth grade, and I know Jonathan since social studies class in fourth grade. Um, and we kind of grew up together. And you know, what we decided was actually when we went off to college, before we went off to college, we said we we're going to start a company together, right? We we're brainstorming and brainstorming. I've been involved in politics and, and whatnot and technology. Uh, you know, I worked briefly at a company called Square, building out their product and, and you know, business development teams. And one of the things that we were really interested in was this problem of understanding the relationship between government um, and business. Um, and so what we did was we actually bootstrapped uh, about $20,000. Um, you know, kind of grab some cash together from summer jobs and things like that. And then we moved out to Silicon Valley, right? Because we were 21 at the time, and we were like, hey, what, what are we going to do? Um, well, we might as well just move out to Silicon Valley. Um, and so some of you may not know this, but it's really, really expensive in Silicon Valley. Uh, and so we got there, we realized we actually couldn't afford an apartment. Um, and so what we ended up doing was we lived out of a Motel 6 uh, for about four months. And you can totally imagine this, right? So there's three guys, and we had uh, two employees. So uh, two guys, two a bed, and one guy on the floor. That's pretty much how we spent our first four months in the Valley. Um, and we spent literally, uh, I want to say, like 14, 15 hours a day grinding it out, building our products, calling customers, um, you know, trying to get our company off the ground. Um, and uh, you know, about three months into the company, we actually hit a major breakthrough. So we actually built a prototype that was working. Uh, you know, we were able to build a search engine on top of legislation across the country. We built a base level algorithm for understanding the outcomes of legislation. And what we did was we essentially said we were going to build uh, a company off of it, right? So we ended up going out into the valley, trying to raise some capital. Uh, we had some initial customers back then. And uh, luckily, we ended up raising about $1.3 million from uh, Mark Cuban, uh, Jerry Yang, uh, NEA, which is a very large venture capital firm, and first round capital uh, out in, uh, in, in the valley, and actually moved the company back out to Washington, DC. So that's where we were seeing a lot of our customers. Um, this is our first office here in Washington. This is the entire office. Um, it's actually probably about half the size of this room, probably smaller than that. Um, we, we built the company from here about up to about 20, 30 people, um, just grinding it out. Like these, these are the, the days that you remember really, really vividly because they're just very hard in building processes, building product, fumbling through pricing, fumbling through marketing, uh, fumbling through a lot of customer pitch events with uh, a very faulty product. Um, and this is our company about uh, December of, of, this, of last year. Um, and just continue to grow our staff, continue to grow uh, the types of people that we have in the company. Um, so one of the questions that I get most often is like, how do you take on such big companies, right? Like, how do you take on companies like Bloomberg, Thomson Reuters, LexisNexis, and these, the combined market cap of these companies, you know, over $80 billion, right? If, you know, we're going up against hundreds of thousands of employees, seasoned executives, what are the cases? Well, um, the first thing, is that hiring is everything, right? The team that you have from the very beginning of the company is important. Um, we were lucky in that you know, our initial team, this is our very, very first group of people after our, our seed round, was very experienced. They had built companies before. Um, our head of sales um, had you know, previously built uh, the, the sales function at Zillow and then went over uh, to Tumblr, built out the sales function at Tumblr, and came over to our company, built that company up, uh, to our company up. Our head of engineering comes from Bloomberg, and before that was the head of architecture at AOL. Uh, and we're able to kind of bring them onto our company ahead of our engineering team. Uh, you know, a variety of different members from Goldman Sachs, NASA, Google, Morgan Stanley, uh, the Marine Corps, uh, in order to kind of make sure that we have the best and the brightest from the very beginning of the company. Um, the other thing we did was we built a great advisory network, right? So uh, a couple of folks here that, that are part of our advisory network, uh, Catherine Weymouth, the founder, uh, the, not the founder, but the, the, the publisher and CEO of the Washington Post, uh, Glenn Hubbard, uh, who is the, the chief economic advisor to President Bush, uh, General Stanley McChrystal, Alec Ross, who is the senior uh, technology advisor to Secretary Clinton, uh, John Celestia of LegalZoom, and then Tony Ng, the founder of Yahoo Pipes and YQL, Yahoo. Um, these are some great, great advisors that we had got on from very, very early. This was probably when we were three guys on a laptop that had helped build our company from the ground up and, and get, our, get our company off the ground. Um, the other element, of course, is that um, you know, a lot of people kind of read through companies uh, you know, case histories and whatnot, and, and say that you know, culture is important, right? I mean, one of the most important quotes that I keep still on my desk today is that culture is strategy for breakfast, right? That it's really, really important from the very beginning of the company when you are, you know, just starting out. Just as important as building out the product, building out the marketing, building out the messaging, is really trying to understand what is the type of company and the type of workplace you want to build 
because this is the thing that destroys companies very rapidly. Um, at our company, we've defined a couple of different values, right? Like level up. We invest in our employees very heavily in terms of professional development, focusing on design, uh, being aligned and transparent. One of the things that I do every quarter is actually uh, take all of our investor materials, all of our financials, all of our board documents, all of our strategic documents, and send it out to all of our employees, right? So, you know, almost 200 employees now, every employee has access to our financials, every employee has access to our board documents. And the reason why we provide this hyper level of transparency is because we want to make sure that the company is fully and completely aligned across the board, that nobody has any questions about the strategy, nobody has any questions about what we're trying to do. And my job as a CEO of the company is really simple, right? Hire the best people, stick them in the right places, make sure they understand the strategy, and then get out of the way, right? Because if you have the best people and you have them fully aligned and transparent against the mission, your job is to basically just empower them to do their jobs fairly well. Um, the other lesson that we learned you know, very early on was that capital partners are very hard to pick. And I say capital partners, not investors, because capital partners uh, really are partners along the entire life cycle of the business, right? When you pick an investor, you are stuck with that investor for the life cycle of the entire company. Um, luckily, we were able to build some great uh, relationships with our investors, Mark Cuban, Jerry Yang, Steve Case, uh, Ren Ren, uh, NEA, Winklevoss Capital, and Tim Osek, the Singaporean government, have been incredible partners for us as we kind of built up our company from the ground up. Um, and everything that we do, um, there's no real kind of adversarial relationship with our investors, right? Because we picked great capital partners that have helped us in every step of the way. When we were trying to build a product, they were there. We were trying to get our first customers, they were there. We were scaling up the company, building out a management team, building out uh, the market, scaling the company. Uh, you know, they, were, they were there every step of the way and helping us understand patterns in, in which different companies uh, you know, uh, went through and, and the different pitfalls that they faced over time. Um, so before I end, I, I just want to kind of talk about two things. The first thing is, um, we, re we view a lot of these enabling technologies in a variety of different ways, but um, some of these technologies in the case of cloud computing or natural language processing, machine learning, and Internet of Things um, are very exciting technologies today. Um, and they enable new capabilities for the enterprise, right? So in our case, cloud computing enables people to understand what's going on right now, right? Being able to search and understand what's going on, right? Natural language processing understands, you know, helps people take the massive information and make it super relevant to just what they're looking for. Uh, machine learning allows people to create predictive analytics and understand what might happen in the future. And the Internet of Things allows us to be able to get this massive data that can actually help us interpret the impact of these predictive analytics in the future, um, which is a completely different way in which we're thinking about the enterprise today. Um, you know, we, we think that we're kind of in the first step of, of this change and transformation throughout the enterprise. A lot of companies today are still very reactive to what's going on in the industry. Um, you know, we're starting to move in towards a phase where people are starting to be much more reactive, right? Uh, uh, you know, and anticipating and thinking about uh, you know, how we can use predictive analytics for better use cases. Once you unlock these two things, right, where you're less reactive, more anticipatory, then you can actually allow for more collaboration, right, more strategic uh, understanding of, of the business. Um, and that's really where we're kind of headed. Um, the market that we're going after is fairly large. And this is the last point that I want to uh, kind of uh, talk about. Um, the market that we're going after is about $92 billion, you know, legal, compliance, software spend any, any given year. Um, I think a lot of times there's a tendency to try and go after, say, the digital advertising market, right, or the mobile application market, or something a little bit more sexy. Um, but the reality is that the biggest untapped market uh, in America today is the enterprise market, right? There's about a trillion dollars in spend across the country every year and enterprise software spending. Um, and this market is actually the equivalent of a lot of the display advertising market um, in uh, consumer markets today. Uh, the, one that's, the ones that are dominated by you know, the uh, Facebooks, the Googles, the Yahoos, and AOLs of the world. Um, so it's really important to look after and look at markets. They may not be completely obvious, right? Because the reality is that if you, look, if you go after markets that are completely obvious, um, the, the tendency is to have a ton of competitors and actually to have uh, a ton of different power law dynamics that may not actually be beneficial for a lot of startups to come through. So 
Um, this is one of the lessons that we've learned in terms of going after a niche market, expanding, 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 but finding a market and continuously finding markets that are underdeveloped and, and uh, you know, very ripe for disruption. Um, so with that, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me here to talk about some of the, the, the challenges we face. And then I don't know if I have time for you know, a couple of questions, but I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Who wants the first question? Hang on, you gotta you gotta catch the catch the catch box though, huh? All right, you ready? Oh, oh. <laughs> I'll do better. I'll do better. So my question is about your hi there, Brian White, uh, Global MBA full time. Um, just wondering, once you had your first investor, I don't know who was your first investor, but I'm wondering, did they like line up the dominoes for you in terms of all those other incredible investors, or what was the deal there? Yeah, so I want to say that we got really, really lucky um, with our first investor. So our first investor was actually Mark. And um, I was trying to go off and raise some capital at the time. And you know, we knew exactly what we wanted to do and everything. And we had built a prototype and got some customers. Um, and I, I remember watching Shark Tank with uh, a couple of my co-founders um, in our mo little Motel 6 room. And um, uh, we didn't go on Shark Tank, but we, uh, I, I Googled Mark's email, and I just shot him a cold email. Um, <laughs> and much to my surprise, he actually responded. Um, and then within an hour, he was like, hey, sounds really interesting. Um, so I emailed him on a Friday, and then we went back and forth, and I think we got a deal done uh, over the weekend. But he wanted to invest. Uh, a little under uh, three quarters of a million dollars. Um, and then we kind of ended up filling up the rest of the round after that. But I don't know what the counterfactual is, right? Like if Mark hadn't invested, I don't know if we, had, we could have raised the round. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm guessing we could. But um, yeah, I mean, it was definitely interesting. But Mark was actually really helpful in kind of lining up a ton of the investors down the line. And once you line up your first seed round, everything after that is just basically executing, right? Like what are the results that you've given? Like how far are you along in product development? How many customers that you have? What's the revenue traction look like? What does your retention look like in our business and subscription businesses? And those, those metrics tend to matter much more in the later stages of the business. Thank you. Who's next? Oh, gosh. All right. Are you ready? Hello. Hi. Um, I wonder what is your biggest challenge that you have ever faced in your career? Is it like kind of the story or the biggest difficulty that? Our, our biggest challenge? Mm -hmm. um, I remember when we were like 10, less than 10 employees, um, as the CEO, I probably spent 70% of my time interviewing people, um, largely because the hardest thing in the beginning is finding good people. Um, it's really, 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 really hard to find people that are competent, that like align themselves with the mission, um, and then you know work within the cultural constraints that you've set up. Right? Um, finding somebody that fits all of those three pieces is like a unicorn. But you know, trying to build a team like that is is incredibly hard. Right? And much less when you're you know on this very, very tight budget, um, and you're you know you know that you're underpaying employees from a cash perspective. Trying to, to get the best and the brightest to jump over away from like a Bloomberg or like a Google or Goldman Sachs to join your company when you're very, very early is an incredibly hard problem. So I remember you know, from the very beginning of the company, like even, even before we incorporated the company, a lot of my time was like trying to scour LinkedIn or my personal networks or whatever the case was to try and grab the best and the brightest talent. And one of the things I did early on was I, I made a list of uh, the top 10 smartest people that I knew like in my life. And I just called them like one by one. So like, are you interested in, in, in helping me build this company, blah, blah, blah. And like, that, that is incredibly hard, right? Because you're essentially going off and, and trying to build this team from the ground up. Thank you. Who else? Um, I'm just wondering what, um, how, to, how did it benefit you to move to Silicon Valley, and what um, resources are like really there that were um, so useful to you to move across the country to grab? Yeah, I mean, I think Silicon Valley has a lot of merit. I mean, certainly the Valley is where a lot of the technology companies have been traditionally started. Um, I, I, I can give like an entire tirade about why I don't like Silicon Valley, but 
Uh, my, my major point is, you know, number one, we want it to be closer to our customers. I think, you know, macroeconomically speaking, um, there's this distribution of startups around the country, and startups are clustering around areas in which um, they, can, they, ha they can service a specific customer set, and they can access a talent pool, you know, essentially like a group of people that are interested in solving that problem, right? So, you know, if you want to build um, a very, very large scale fintech company, right, going after investment banks and whatnot, you should, you know, probably start your company in, in, on, you know, in New York and around Wall Street. If you really want to build a biotech company, one of the big areas, apart from the DC area, you know, you might want to start is in maybe Boston. Um, a lot of ad tech companies these days are starting out in Los Angeles to be closer to a lot of the you know, big name producers and, and television studios. Um, as these major, major large companies are starting to get a lot more interested in startups as a vehicle for innovation, um, you know, startups are increasingly starting to relocate into those areas. Now, why do we go into Silicon Valley? You know, Silicon Valley, for all of the hype that it gets, does live up to the hype in a couple of different things. There is a critical mass of technology people that are interested in solving very hard technology problems. Um, there's a critical mass of capital um, and, and capital networks that you can kind of tap into. Um, but I don't think that they're, you necessarily in this day and age have to start a company in the Valley. Like if I had to do everything over again, I would have just stayed here in Washington and kind of built the company from the ground up. Um, now you can still go back and forth you know, from the Valley and try and raise capital, but um, I think for us, it was probably more of our naivete that we actually moved out to the Valley because you know, we were like 20, 21 year olds, 21 year olds at the time. Like we didn't really know how to build a company. This is the first company that we were building, um, you know, commercial company that we were building. Um, and so that's sort of like what the, the young entrepreneur, the young, you know, uh, naive entrepreneur does to kind of go off and start a company, I think.